Can you remember your first history lesson? As it happens, I can. Uh, because I was told a story, and it's the story I remember, so I know that it was in a history lesson. Uh, it was at a little rural primary school in the West Country. Very old-fashioned, old, much-carved wooden desks and chairs. Uh, because it was in the countryside, along the window sill, were little fish paste pots with wildflowers in them, speedwell, campion, forget-me-not, all these, and I got to know a lot of wildflowers through that. Uh, you could look out of the great tall windows. Um, when you're seven, all windows are tall. But I could see fields with sheep, uh, and the, they got through the lambing. The lambs were now getting quite large. Uh, you regularly passed cow pats in the main village street. Uh, you, you follow the general idea. <coughs> and Miss decided that she was going to tell us a story. I suppose she felt that we'd worked hard enough during the day and we deserved a story at the end of the afternoon. So she left her desk where she did her her sacred marking of the register, which was almost a, a religious ritual in the morning, and she came and sat on one of the front desks in the main body of the class. And she told us all about King Harold and the Battle of Hastings. I'd never heard the story before, and it absolutely bowled me over. Uh, I found myself identifying with, with the sun, particularly the English, obviously. And I came to think that Harold was a pretty jolly good chap. And when Miss told us that Harold had been shot in the eye, I was appropriately uh, disappointed, very sad. Uh, <clears throat> but how had he got shot in the eye? He got shot in the eye because Duke William on the other side had ordered his archers to fire up in the air. Up till then, they'd been firing their arrows like everybody else in, a, in an ordinary army, at straight at the enemy. But Harold had used the shields of his soldiers to protect them against the arrows. So William broke the rules, cheated a bit, and didn't fire the arrows at the shields anymore, but fired them up in the air so that they would drop on the English, which was a bit of a dirty trick, but that was nothing compared with the dirty trick that the Normans employed shortly afterwards. Because at the height of the battle, uh, the Normans ran away down the hill, the English on top of a hill, <coughs> and the Normans would come up the hill, and they turned around, ran away down the hill. So the English thought they'd won, and they chased down the hill after the Normans to cut them up and polish them off. And then, guess what? These rotten Normans turned round uh, and started fighting again. They, they weren't running away at all. They'd only pretended to run away, which I thought was the dirtiest of all, dirty tricks, and of course it won. Dirty tricks often do. Cheats, I'm afraid, do prosper. And the Normans won, and Harold was killed, and it was a great shame. Uh, so whenever I thought about this lesson, um, part of my uh, thinking was taken up with a sense of outrage at what stinkers the Normans were. But the other half of my thinking was taken up with something that crossed my mind while Miss was actually telling us the story. And it was, here, there's something in this. I can almost remember the wording of, of the thought as it occurred to me. There's something in this history. And it was my first, my first remembered acquaintance with it. And I've been telling stories about history pretty well ever since. And to tell a story now, you're faced with a common problem. Where do you start? Well, it seemed logical, logical to start about 1066. It's as good a place as any. Why 1066? Why not? It was my first lesson, so it was particularly fixed in my memory. As the Chinese, I believe, are supposed to have said, the longest journey begins with a single stride. So if I'm going to tackle the whole of English history, it really doesn't matter where I start. And another advantage that 1066 and Hastings has uh, is, of course, everybody knows something about it. 
Or at least they think they know something about it. The further back you contemplate a historical event, uh, the more difficult it becomes. If I can take an illustration from art, perspective. If you drew a picture of um, a wooden fence, the first fence paling that you look at is quite wide. The second one is a bit narrower. The third one is narrower still. And so, as you know, that goes on until there are no lines of the palings at all. It's just one mishmash of colour. And the same thing applies when you look back to events in history. This foreshortening takes place. You have to telescope periods more and more and more until in the end you finish up with a sort of general impression. And this is what often happens with primary school projects. If, you've, if Miss decided to do a project, say, on a um, medieval monastery, uh, she doesn't go into the details of the Benedictine rule. She doesn't go, in, she doesn't go into the details of, of how you organise a monastic day. The children just did a project on what it was like to be a medieval monk. So we have pictures of monks' habits. We have a picture of a monastery. We have a picture of the writing room. No actual events. So it becomes merely impressionistic. If you want to find out something more, you've got to read something more. Very little real detail. So the same thing applies to Normandy. If you think you know something about the Norman conquest, well, let's try one or two things. Can you name two rivers in Normandy? Can you name two seaports in Normandy? Can you name a cathedral city in Normandy? There are half a dozen of them. Can you even tell us why Normandy was called Normandy? The minute you're told, of course, you say, yes, that's obvious. What had happened in the ninth, 8th and ninth century, Vikings had travelled everywhere, as you know, um, causing mayhem and destruction all over the place. And they were known, obviously, as the Northmen, because they had come from the north. Some of them settled in the north of France. The King of France was um, at his wit's end to know what to do with these Norman raiders, until in the end he thought, right, well, if they've come here to look for land and to seize it, let's give them some. And that might stop the other raids coming. By and large, it worked. So they settled in northern France. So the Northmen settled in what they became, uh, what became known as Northmandy. Northmandy became Normandy. So that's where Normandy comes from. Uh, but to carry on the, the, the questionnaire, apart from 1066, can you name another single date in Norman history? Take William. What do you know about William the Conqueror? All right, so he was called William the Conqueror, but he was 38 years old when he conquered England. Do you know anything about uh, William before he was 38 years old? I bet you don't. Oh, yes, you might know one thing. You will know that he was called William the Bastard. Why? Obviously, because his father had neglected to marry his mother. We know his mother's name, Arlette. She lived in a Norman town called Falaise. Uh, if you go to Falaise today, uh, you will see a castle, and they will tell you that it is the castle of Duke Robert of Normandy. It wasn't actually, it was built sometime later, but never mind. That's what the legend is for the tourists. And the story goes that Robert looked out of the window of his castle one day, and down by the stream there were some young women of the town doing the family laundry and he rather liked the look of one of them and as Norman barons and Norman lords were accustomed to doing he sent word down that this particular one Arlette was to be brought up to the castle. Later on um, uh, he didn't marry her but he took her as his life's partner and she became the mother of William. Uh, so that's the legend. So say they'll even show you the window in Falaise Castle out of which Robert looked when he caught sight of Arlette. But it's a different castle, I'm afraid. Anyway, William came to the throne very young because his father had gone on a pilgrimage, got ill, died, so didn't come back, and William found himself in charge of a duchy at the age of seven or eight. 
Uh, you can imagine what happened. Uh, his rule in Normandy was beset by, by other uh, barons, nobles, foreigners, the King of France, pretty well anybody who fancied his chances of seizing a bit of extra territory. And William was very fortunate in, in having uh, two or three guardians who looked after him very fa In fact, two died in their duty of looking after William. So he grew up in a very, very stern set of circumstances. On at least two occasions, he was yanked out of bed in the middle of the night because assassins were actually in the castle with the daggers out trying to kill him. You can imagine what a life like this must have done to a growing boy. So he grew up very hard indeed. He learned soldiering very early. He was commanding men in battle when he was 15 years old. So by the time he got to 38, there wasn't very much you could tell William about running a duchy in medieval France. Uh, he was a very successful one too. He had plenty of enemies, uh, particularly the King of France himself. This was the man who, at the age of 38, had embarked on the conquest of England. Uh, why? Well, we'll come to that a little bit later on. The illegitimacy. Today, um, illegitimacy doesn't matter very much. Not all that long ago, a young woman who got herself into an interesting condition could often face the door of her own house slammed in her face and her own father telling her never to darken the doorstep again. Luckily, that's all gone. But in 11th century Normandy, it was a very, very serious business indeed. The most important thing in the world was land. And you had to have your title to that land secured beyond any possible doubt or challenge. And the way to do that was to prove that your father had married your mother. So the succession could be proved, you would have continuity, you would have security. Medieval Europe lived in a state of far greater insecurity than we do today. Um, what do we know about the country he conquered? Frankly, not very much. Na name three facts about England in the 11th century. You might know it was ruled by somebody called Edward the Confessor. True, but I bet you don't know why he was called Edward the Confessor. Um, do you know about the, the old countries of England? Do you know if I said the word to you, heptarchy, would it mean anything? In fact, it means the land of the seven kingdoms. Heptarchy comes from a Greek word meaning seven. Uh, based on the early conquests of the Saxons. As you well know, the South Saxons settled in what became and is Sussex, the East Saxons, Essex, the West Saxons, Wessex, and so on. Curiously, we do not have a county of Nossex. We don't know what happened to the North Saxons, if indeed there were any. They used the word shire, uh, so that much would have been familiar to you. Um, in fact, the man in charge of the shire uh, produces another word which you're extremely familiar with for another reason. A man put in charge of a farm or an estate was known as the reeve. So a man put in charge of a shire was known as a shire reeve. Carry that on for a few decades, allow for people's laziness and pronunciation, and shire reeve becomes sheriff. Sheriff was the chief executive officer in a county in England in the 11th century. <clears throat> As you well know, sheriff means something completely different in America. So we know a little bit, well, I've just told you a little bit about the shires, about the counties, but you would be making a mistake if you thought of England as one single country. Now, geographically, of course, it was. But culturally, uh, demographically, to use a long word, it wasn't. Why? Because of the invasions of the Vikings from the 8th century onwards. As you well know, uh, at least I hope you do, 
King Alfred made his reputation defeating the invading Danes. Being not only a warrior, but a very shrewd statesman as well, he tried to provide for the future by arranging that there should be no more wars. So he did what the King of France did to the Normans. He gave them some land. He signed a treaty which allowed the Danes to settle in the area of England, which they had already been trying to conquer, the north and the east. And he allowed that Danish law should run in these particular counties. Hence the word Dane law. That was the area of England where Danish law applied and where the customs were Danish, where a large slice of the population were Danish or descended from Danes. So England was not exactly two countries, but there, there were two clearly defined sections of it. All right, there was intermarriage, there was trade, a gradual merging the one into the other, but they still had separate personalities. Uh, and that applied in 1066. Uh, so you didn't know that. You didn't know about the, the old countries. How much do you know about the culture of England in the 11th century? Not much, I don't suppose, neither do I. And certainly neither did the Normans. They were going to somewhere about which they knew very little indeed. They probably didn't have much idea of how, how big it was. And they certainly didn't have much idea about the population. Have you any idea how many people lived in England in 1066? Now there are about 60 million. In 1066, so far as we can judge, there were less than 2 million, one thirtieth of what we've got now. Well, we all think we know about the Norman Conquest. William the Conqueror sailing across, landing at Hastings, fighting a great big battle and winning. So we know the mechanics of it. We know how. But do we know why? What brought William over here to conquer England? Well, you would think one motive might be pretty obvious, greed. Uh, William was a greedy man, certainly. When he died and they wrote his obituary, uh, they did mention the fact that he was avaricious. They used the word avarice. Uh, he was avaricious beyond average. Uh, so that much is most definitely true. A prince, a duke, a count, a king, whatever you like, in the 11th century had to develop his image if he was to stay in business to attract a following, to protect his rule, to help his people feel, feel secure. He had to do big things. He had to do noble things. He had to give justice. He had to be fair. Uh, he had to provide for the future. <clears throat> and he had to keep a, an eye out for the main chance to show his own people and everybody else that he was not to be trifled with. <clears throat> so William saw his chance with England. Um, there's nothing unusual about that. Pretty well all medieval princes did pretty much the same. As an illustration, I'm sure you've heard of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was king of Macedonia in Greece. His entire career was taken up with conquering the Persian Empire, which was enormous. Uh, people often wondered why. Uh, Alexander had grown up in fear of the Persian Empire, and any Greek would want to get his own back on the Persian Empire, ideally, of course, remove it altogether. So the suggestion is that Alexander conquered the Persian Empire because it never occurred to him not to. That was the thing that he was there for. And in a similar way, William got the idea of conquering England because no alternative appeared particularly serious to him. And this was reinforced by the fact that in 1051, 51, 15 years before the conquest, he'd visited England. And he'd met the king, Edward the Confessor. He was, in fact, distantly related to Edward the Confessor because his great-aunt, Emma, Emma of Normandy, was Edward the Confessor's mother. So there was a family relationship. And William claimed, when he got back to Normandy, not only that Edward 
had uh, looked with favour upon him, treated him as a favoured and distinguished guest, and made a great fuss of him, but that he, Edward, would promise him, William, the crown, when he, Edward, died. Now, that's not so preposterous as it sounds, because William, sorry, Edward, uh, had no children, and he was not going to have any either, because he had refused to have any kind of intimate relations with his wife. So the succession, the question of the succession, was yawning wide open and getting wider with each successive year. So when the story got around that Edward had promised the crown to William, you can imagine the effect that this would have in, uh, in Normandy, and in England for that matter, uh, great hope and excitement, possibly in Normandy, uh, annoyance, indignation, even outrage in England. Who did this jumped-up bastard duke think he was, talking about inheriting the throne of England? But there, that was a motive, and a very, very powerful motive. That, plus the fact, as I said, he always had an eye to the main charge. Any medieval prince did. Any medieval prince had to carve a reputation for himself. He was only as successful as his last campaign. <clears throat> that was what medieval dukes did. Now, that does not mean that William the Conqueror leapt out of bed one morning, feeling good, and said, Hooray! Yippee! What a splendid morning this is in the Middle Ages. It's great to be living in the Middle Ages. I know, chaps. Let's go and conquer England today, shall we? Clearly, it was not like that. It took a very long time. And one of the questions that needed to be asked was, was it realistic? It's all very well to have these wonderful ideas, but look at the size of England, look at the size of Normandy. Was it really going to work? Was it realistic? And if it wasn't, how on earth was he going to sell it to his, uh, to his barons, to his vassals, to his, to his sub-tenants? <clears throat> you see, William just couldn't issue a set of call-up papers and expect all his Norman barons to, to come to the feudal host and bring all their soldiers with him. Because generally speaking, um, there well, not only generally, but always, there were laws about this. The rules said that a knight was bound to serve his overlord for 40, year, 40 days a year, free. 40 days a year, free. But most of the regulations implied that that service of 40 days a year only meant within the territory that he ruled, in other words, Normandy. It didn't cover going on wild adventures to places like England. And in any case, quite a large number of his Norman vassals thought it was crazy. They too had looked at the map of England and Normandy. Uh, and they reckoned Normandy w would be on a hiding to nothing. Look at the population of England, look at the resources of England, look at the size of England's army, look at the reputation, look at their history. They had 500 years of history. The Normans had only been there 150 years. They didn't stand a chance. So too many Norman barons who'd worked very hard all their lives to, to carve out their own particular set of property weren't going to risk it all on some crazy enterprise in England where they could lose the lot. So not all William's vassals were willing to follow him, not by a long chalk. Then he tried the idea of the oath. I, I don't know how much you know about this, but this is coming later on in the talk. Harold swore an oath that when Edward the Confessor died, that the throne would pass to William and that he, Harold, would not stand in William's way. Harold later on broke this oath by becoming king himself. So William could use the great story that Harold was a perjurer, therefore William was doing the decent thing by invading England to put right a great sin committed by Harold, Earl of Wessex. Now, did the Norman barons buy this idea? <clears throat> I should think it's very unlikely. Um, the oath itself, the very story of the oath, didn't sound very likely. It didn't sound very likely that Harold was be, um, willing to keep it. Harold possibly only swore it in order to get back to England. He was living with William at the time, in Normandy, staying with William. 
Nevertheless, it was a good story, and it was very respectable. It made the conquest respectable. William was carrying out the wishes of God by punishing a sinner. So, as I said, it was a good story, and it was a good line. But the odds, I repeat, were very, very unfair. We, if you had gone to a bookie in 1066 and said, what are the odds on England and Normandy? He would have given you very short odds, very poor odds on William and very good odds on England. And that's ironic because <clears throat> you know about the Spanish Armada. In 1588, again, look at the map, look at the size of England, look at the size of Spain. We didn't have a cat in hell's chance against the Spanish Armada. The same thing applied when we fought against Louis XIV. He was enormously more powerful than England. And we didn't lose that either. In 1805, Napoleon's army was poised on the coast of France, only 30 miles away, all ready to invade England. And we didn't think we had, in, in, in sheer numbers, we didn't have the resources to stop him. But we didn't lose that war either. In 1940, the odds were even longer against us. The whole of Nazi Europe was under the, well, the whole of Europe was under the Nazi rule. We didn't stand a cat in hell's chance then either. And we survived that. So the Spanish Armada, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Hitler, each time we were the underdog and we won. And in 1066, we were not the underdog, we were the top dog and we lost. I don't know if there's a moral in that anywhere. Who saw 1066 coming? Did it show any signals on the horizon? <clears throat> it's interesting that many of the, or several of the big dates in English history uh, took people by surprise. And you could argue that, that 1066 was one of them. The, the Civil War was another. The Civil War broke out in 1642. But in 1641, nobody had the faintest idea that the Civil War was on the way. And when it broke out, many, many men, serious, scholarly, sensitive men, knowledgeable men, scratched their heads and shook their heads and said, how on earth did this come about? How did we get to be in this position of fighting a war against our fellow countrymen? Same thing happened in 1914. The country went on holiday in July of 1914. They'd heard that some Austrian duke had got himself assassinated. That was a bit of a yawn. Nobody took much notice. And by August the 4th, the whole of Europe was at war. Again, men shook their heads and wondered how on earth it had all come about. The big things take you by surprise. All right, William the Conqueror, let's go back to 1066. William the Conqueror saw it coming, all right? He wanted it to come. All he had to do was to wait for Edward the Confessor to die, and Edward was not all that old, so he might have to wait a long time. But did France want it, or did France see it coming? Very unlikely. The French king would always look out for an opportunity to score over Normandy, but beyond that, I don't see how his crystal ball could have told him anything about the events of 1066 in advance. <clears throat> England, no, we had a safe king, Edward, the confessor. Um, we know that, well, they knew then that he didn't have um, an obvious successor. And they knew they didn't want William. But by this time, clearly, far and away above everybody else, the second man in the kingdom was Harold, the Earl of Wessex. He was the king's right-hand man. He was the second man in the kingdom. He practically ran the country. If ever there was an obvious next king, it was Harold. The only thing against him was that he did not uh, belong to the blood royal, but he was the obvious next king. <clears throat> uh, did other people take notice? Yes, uh, surprisingly, Norway took notice because there was a very powerful and a, a a king in Normandy, also called Harold. Uh, we distinguish the two because our Harold was Harold with an O. Uh, in Norway, it was Harald with an A. 
and he had an eye on the throne of England too. He was another prince, always looking out for the main chance. Uh, he had a fearsome reputation. He had fought everybody. He had been in every country. He had even been a member of the legendary bodyguard of the emperor at Constantinople, no less. It was a fearsome, legendary reputation. And the mere sight of him uh, was enough to strike awe into anybody. Apparently, he stood six feet six, when the average height of a man was barely five feet six. Uh, and Harald of Normandy, Harald Hadrada, they called him, the stern ruler, he had eyes for the English crown. So there, was the Nor there were the Normans, uh, Norwegians, um, all ready to jump when something happened. By the same token, surprisingly, Denmark had eyes on England as well. Doesn't look a very big country now, and it isn't, but it was very powerful. In the 11th century, we had already had four Danish kings. Everybody's heard of King Canute, but he wasn't the first, he was the second. His father, Swain, conquered England in 1014. And son, Canute, succeeded in 1016. And his two sons succeeded him in 1035. We had had four Danish kings. So the Danes were very interested in what was going on in England in 1066. Flanders, which is nowadays Holland and Belgium, they were interested too, not so much because of politics, but because of the trade. Flanders was the centre of a wool and weaving trade. England produced an awful lot of sheep. An enormous amount of trade passed between the two countries. So the Count of Flanders was immensely interested in English politics for business reasons. Germany, no, probably too far away. But soldiers of fortune in Germany kept their eyes and ears open. And there was no shortage of soldiers of fortune when William was building his army. In the middle of 1066, they came flocking in from everywhere. Germany, Denmark, Lorraine, Alsace, Switzerland, northern Italy, northern Spain, you name it, they came in from these places to join William's army and see what rich pickings there would be. A word of warning. When you decide to study any year from the past, always try and look at it from the point of view of the people who lived in it. Don't look at 1066 with the preconceptions of the year 2019. An obvious example is this word Europe. Now we know that France and England and Italy and Spain and all the rest in 1066 were in the continent of Europe, just as they are today. And we talk about living in Europe today, but men in 1066 did not talk about living in Europe. If they wanted a word to convey the whole, the whole lot, if you like, they called it Christendom. It was where the word of Christ was supreme. This was the land which had been founded by the Holy Roman Catholic Church, God's Church. They did not use the word Europe. They regarded Christendom uh, as not just a stretch of land, but it was a fortress, it was a bastion, it was the final defence against this sea of wilderness and paganism and heresy uh, that threatened the entire, what we call, Western Europe. Not only that, we were at the mercy of the elements. To the west was the Atlantic Ocean, and nobody knew where that went. To the north was ice and snow, and nobody knew how far that went. To the east was miles and miles of forest and marsh. If you went further north, it was tundra and more ice and snow. If you went south, you would run into the Sahara Desert. So you've got to remember that men in those days, if they thought at all, thought about the world as, as I say, this bastion of Christendom, against the elements, against savage weather, against the climate, and against the pagans and the Muslims and the infidels and whatever other unpleasant adjective you had for describing them. For those who lived in Christendom and who fought to keep it going, life, in a word, was hard. It was a veil of tears. It was hard and it didn't last very long. If you made it to 45 or 50, 
you were doing pretty well. All you could hope for was that when it was over, uh, if you're lucky, uh, you might go to paradise, which was going to be absolutely wonderful. It had jolly well better be after the terrible things that they'd had to put up with in the life they were living. And when you died, of course, it was your body only that died. Your soul survived. And it was your soul that was going to go, you hoped, to heaven. So your soul was important. No matter how harsh life was, no matter how unpleasant many people were, no matter how much cruelty, no matter how much cheating, no matter how much murder, no matter how much crime, most men and women at bottom accepted the fact that your soul was there and that it was eternal, and that it was important. People were concerned about what... They were concerned enough about what happened to their bodies, but they were even more concerned about what happened to their eternal soul. So what they had, what they were putting up with, didn't look as if it was going to be subjected to very much change. It was so hard, it was so unrelenting, there was no hope. This was what life was going to be like. Nothing very much happened, except there were always exceptions. Now and again, there was an event, and that did upset things and people had to react to events. And the one event which is relevant to this particular topic came in the year 1064. News reached France, and reached Normandy, obviously, that there had been a shipwreck. A boat had been cast up on the shore at the mouth of the River Somme in Normandy. And when men went to investigate who was on it, there were crew, obviously, but the most important, there was a celebrity on it, and his name was Harold, and he was the Earl of Wessex. The Earl of Wessex, a Saxon Earl, had been shipwrecked off the coast of Normandy. What on earth were they going to do about that when the Normans heard about it? Inevitably, after they got over the shock, uh, they said, what is he doing in Normandy? What on earth is he up to? The Normans are great chess players. They love planning in advance. They love working out reasons for things. They love working out the background. They like method. They like system. They could not, for the life of them, work out what on earth Harold had in mind when he came to Normandy. It never crossed their mind that he might have come there by accident. Yeah. There was once an Austrian chancellor called Metternich, and in 1815, he was at a famous congress in Vienna, and everybody was there. And in the middle of the night, his servants woke him up to tell him that the Russian ambassador had just suddenly died. And Metternich propped himself on an elbow and said to himself, I wonder what he means by that. The Normans were great ones for wondering what anybody meant by anything. What did Harold mean? What was he up to? What was his real game? And Harold, of course, being Harold, didn't care what they were thinking. If they want to think he wanted to think he was up to something, then he was up to something. His job was to get home. He was the second man in the kingdom. He was running the place. He had to get back as soon as possible. If the Normans wanted to tie themselves in knots, well, that was their business, and he let them get on with it. Harold did get home. That's another story later on. We'll come to that. And everything went quiet until January 1066. And then, my word, things didn't half start to happen. Firstly, Edward the Confessor died on January the 5th, I think it was. On January the 6th, Harold got himself crowned. <laughs> you think Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in June of 1953, but in fact she became queen in February 1952. It took 16 months to crown Elizabeth. It took Harold 24 hours because he had to move fast. He had to get himself on the throne, with the crown on his head, anointed by holy oil, approved of by the church, and all the rest of it, so that he was the rightful, legal, honourable Christian king. And it took him 24 hours, so it didn't hang about. 
Uh, and then what a year. In 1066 saw not one king but three on the English throne. There were two coronations. There was Halley's Comet. Ever heard of Halley's Comet? Well, it appeared in 1066 in the sky, and it's in the tapestry. There is a picture of this star in the heavens, and people pointing to it and wondering, another thing, what on earth is that? What does that mean? What on earth is going on there? And of course, because it was a celestial happening, uh, the world was not short, and England was not short of people to wag their finger in the air and say, hey, you mark my words, no good will come of it. So it set off all sorts of superstitious reactions among the English. There was not one invasion of England, there were two. Uh, while before that happened, um, <clears throat> Harold had to build an army where most of his troops were away farming. William had to build an army. This is where he brought in all those soldiers of fortune from all over the place. He also had to build a navy. How could he get his soldiers across the channel to say nothing of thousands of horses? Without building, he had to build a fleet first, not just the odd ship. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of ships. We're talking about thousands of horses. You think of the feat of organisation that's required, not just collecting the personnel, but uh, building the damn thing, felling trees, all the saws required, all the adzes, all the nails, everything, all had to be done in one year. Then, of course, it's one thing to get all that ready, but then he needs an army. And as I said, he can't send out call-up papers. He has to persuade enough of his vassals, enough of his barons, to commit themselves to something which could lose them everything, life, property, family, the lot. He had to be very, very persuasive indeed. And there was not one battle in 1066, there were three. And Harold <coughs> very nearly won two of them. The first one is in the north called Fulford when the King of Norway arrived and won a battle. The second battle was at Stamford Bridge where Harold marched 200 miles in the space of a fortnight, caught the Vikings unprepared and annihilated them. Then came news that William had landed, so he had to march 200 miles all the way back again and took on William at Hastings, and he very nearly won. It was touch and go, right until the end of the afternoon. Now you just think, if Harold had pulled that off, if Harold had marched nearly 200 miles, defeated the greatest Viking alive, annihilated his army, marched 200 miles back again, defeated William, annihilated the Normans. His reputation would have rung down the centuries. He would have been up there with Marlborough and the Duke of Wellington, possibly even higher. And he came so close. Uh, and that wasn't all. Uh, I haven't told you yet that Scotland was involved in all this because the Scots never missed an opportunity to invade England and cause trouble if they thought England was in trouble. So there was an invasion from Scotland. There was an invasion too from one of Harold's brothers. Uh, there were a family of six sons. Swain had died. Harold was all right. The next one of his younger brothers was called Tostig. And Tostig had been made Earl of Northumbria made a mess of it, Harold sacked him, and Tostig spent the rest of his life swearing vengeance and threatening to invade with whoever could, he could persuade to give him an army and a fleet. So Tostig was going to invade as well. And Tostig finished up first with Scotland and then with the King of Norway. Tostig was a nuisance. A thoroughly nasty piece of work too. So we had Fulford, we had Stamford Bridge, we had Hastings. At the end of it all, Tostig was dead, he died at Stamford Bridge. Harold Hadrada was dead, he died at Stamford Bridge. Uh, the man who fired that arrow uh, must have, or would have congratulated himself for the rest of his life had he lived. He took a pot shot at Harold Hadrada, six feet six, and struck him in the throat. And Hadrada died. Uh, I've no doubt that the Vikings um, went berserk for revenge afterwards, and that archer couldn't have lived to enjoy his success for very long. Even William, you would think, having won the battle, everything would have been all right. No, William got dysentery. You can imagine what camp life was like. No hygiene at all. 
uh, William was laid out for four or five weeks with dysentery. So he could have gone too. Imagine the vacuum then. And even that was not the end, because at last he got himself crowned on Christmas Day of 1066. And everybody who was anybody, those who were left, uh, was in Westminster Abbey, Edward the Confessor's brand new Westminster Abbey. <coughs> when it got to the stage where uh, they had to ask the crowd whether they approved of King William, so they all were going to shout, long live King William. They did. They let rip with an enormous shout. And the crowd outside heard it. And the Norman troops guarding the streets heard it. And they thought there was a riot. They thought everything had gone wrong. So they dashed round all the houses round about the abbey, burning them down. They could have been within an inch of burning down the abbey itself. They say even William was, was shaken by what had happened. The chronicler refers to the fact that William's knuckles whitened as he held on to the arms of the coronation throne. Uh, but, all right, it turned out to be a false alarm. But it was a very close call once again. So, so what do you know about the bio-tapestry? short answer is probably not much. But you know it's a tapestry, obviously. You know that it was made of bio, equally obviously. Uh, bio's in France, yes, you know that. Uh, you know it's all about um, the Norman Conquest. Uh, that's how we know so much about the Norman Conquest. You know that it was made by William the Conqueror. And you know that it's all about Hastings. <laughs> well, not quite. Um, historians are the most terrible killjoys. Uh, they will tell you that Harold was not shot in the eye with an arrow, after all. More of that, perhaps, later on. They tell you that Alfred didn't burn the cakes. What a shame. They tell you that Robin Hood did not look like Errol Flynn, and he didn't win the war against King John all by himself. He probably didn't exist at all. Uh, and King John didn't sign Magna Carta, because he couldn't write. Um, so, by the same token, I have to tell you, being a, a killjoy historian, that the biotapestry was not made in Bayeux. It's only talked about. They only call it the biotapestry because the first reference to it comes in the 15th century, over 400 years after it was commissioned. And they found it in a church inventory, inventory in, in, in Bayeux. That's why they call it the biotapestry. Otherwise, it had nothing to do with Bayeux. Uh, it was not ordered by William, we know that. We think that most of the scholars seem to agree that it was ordered by William's brother, Odo, Bishop of Bayeux. But you think? Uh, William, uh, William's mother, Arlette, remember Arlette? Um, when uh, Robert died, she married again. When her husband died, she married again. Or not the man who was not her husband, but her partner died, she married again. She really did marry this chap. He was a, a tradesman in, in uh, Falaise, I think, and she had two children. One of them was Odo, and William made him Bishop of Bayeux when he was 14. Um, so the Bayeux tapestry was not made in Bayeux. It was not ordered by William. And as for being all about the Battle of Hastings, they don't mention the Battle of Hastings till it's about 75% over. Only 25% of the tapestry is about the Battle of Hastings. Oh, yeah, and the final thing, it wasn't a tapestry. <laughs> it was an embroidery. So there. You say it wasn't about Hastings. What about all those pictures? The axes and the swords and the horses and the arrows. It's true, true, true. But 75% of the bio-tapestry is about other things as well. The bio-tapestry tells you only what the Normans want you to know. Give an example. I told you that it was created by Odo, Bishop of Bayeux. Now, two Norman bishops fought at Hastings. One was Odo himself, bully for, him, bully for Odo. Another was a man called Geoffrey, who was the Bishop of Coutances, a town in western Normandy. Now, Odo and Geoffrey didn't get on. And it's most interesting that when you look at the tapestry, you'll see Odo depicted three or four times, but you don't see Geoffrey at all. 
Odo edited Geoffrey right out of, of the bio tapestry. So it tells you what it wants you to know. So you mean it isn't true? Oh yes, it's true, but it's not the whole truth. It's out to prove something. Medieval historians always wanted a moral to their stories. History was not just one damn thing after another. It all meant something, and you could always get a lesson from it. There was a great deal of finger-wagging involved with medieval historians. God was involved. Harold had lost, not because he wasn't good enough. Harold lost because he ought to have lost. He had sinned, and God had punished him. Serve him jolly well right. He was a perjurer. In medieval illustrations, funnily enough, uh, blinding is often shown as, as a punishment for the sinner. Uh, you should know, we're told that Harold got shot in the eye. More of that later. Uh, so the idea that a sinner was blinded uh, by God's order w was quite a common one. Take the idea of Samson, if you like, whether you could interpret that as God's punishment. Well, if the bio tapestry wasn't about the bio uh, about the Battle of Hastings, what the devil was it about? Well, pretty well everything else: kings, castles, hunting, feasting, shipbuilding, sailing, getting shipwrecked, types of military equipment, horses, cavalry, char absolutely everything under the sun. I mentioned I barely scratched the surface, and there were two hundred and thirty feet of it. There are 230 feet of it now, and as far as we know, very little has been lost. If you want to write a history of almost anything in the medieval world, you'll find evidence in the bio-tapestry. You'll get some ammunition out of the bio-tapestry. Now let's go back for a minute. Why would Harold go to Normandy? It doesn't seem to make sense. The, one of the very first panels in the tapestry appears to show us that King Edward is ordering Harold to go to Normandy, which seems odd. The interpretation is that Harold is being sent by Edward to Normandy to confirm the promise that William will get the crown. Now this doesn't make sense either because Harold is the second man in the kingdom. He's the obvious next king. How is it that Edward is able to get Harold to go to Normandy to promise a thing like this? Did he have the authority? Could he make Harold go? Did he really have the strength to confirm his orders? We don't know. So was he just obeying the king or was it something else? Was Harold using the opportunity? Was he, he was a great opportunist. An opportunist. If Edward had ordered him to go, Harold might have said, well, all right, I'll go. It'll give me a chance to size up the opposition, find out what sort of a man William is, case the joint, get the feel of Normandy. So Harold could be using it uh, for his own purposes. Uh, I haven't told you yet. Um, Harold had a couple of relations, a, a brother and a, and a nephew. When William had visited Normandy in 1051, and Edward had promised him the crown, so they said. Um, hostages were given. It was a regular thing in the Middle Ages. If you had an agreement, a promise, anything like that, one side gave hostages to the other for good behaviour, obviously. If the, if, the, if the partner in the agreement didn't, didn't obey, then the hostages, the hostages get killed. And these two young Saxon hostages have been living in Normandy since 1051. So the suggestion is that Harold went to Normandy to get these two young men back. Why? Obviously because he was clearing the decks for when the time would come when he would have to defend England against William because he obviously would, everybody knew that. These two men were out for the crown and they were rivals and clearly some kind of reckoning was going to come somewhere. So was Harold in Normandy simply to try to get these two boys back <coughs> from being hostages? Was he simply clearing the decks? Or another interpretation, was he not going to Normandy at all? Uh, it was quite common in the 11th century for 
noblemen, those with ships, to travel by sea when the alternative was available. Travel by land was terrible. Roads were awful. Uh, not only off, they could be dangerous. I mean, there was no police force. Uh, there were no traffic alarms or anything like this. Anything could happen on the road. As late as the 18th century, 700 years later, John Wesley, the Methodist preacher, nearly drowned in a pothole on the Great North Road. That gives you some idea of how uncomfortable road travel was. So if you had a chance to travel from one part of Hampshire to Sussex, shall we say, and you had the chance of travelling by sea, you travel by sea. Much easier. And Harold, he was the Earl of Wessex. He had access to seaports all round Hampshire and Sussex. It makes perfect sense that Harold was on a boat trip. And another thing that um, gives you that impression too, the third or fourth panel in the bio tapestry shows you Harold leaving the king. But he's not just riding away. He has hounds and falcons with him. Now, if you're going to travel to Normandy on, on an embassy, do you normally take falcons and hounds with you? The suggestion is that Harold was simply on a hunting expedition. Went on board ship to go somewhere else hunting, and there was a storm. Uh, the English Channel is not noted for its similarity to a mill pond. Um, Storms are quite frequent. Harold could simply have been caught. And when you're caught in a westerly storm, most of them were westerly, ships in the 11th century were so poorly constructed that there was no way they could sail against the wind. So the only alternative, if you were hit by a westerly gale, was to go, was to go in front of it, up the channel, until you got tipped onto the shore at the mouth of the River Somme, as Harold was. Once again, of course, we don't know. Many historians have asked why Harold took the chance of going to, assuming he did go in to Normandy by intent. Why? It seemed a very risky thing to do. He was one claimant to the English throne. William was another claimant to the English throne. Did it make sense for one claimant to put himself under the roof of, at the mercy of, the other claimant? Was it not simply asking, begging for trouble? We don't know. We know that Edward was childless. We know that the throne was going to be vacant. Everybody knew that the atmosphere was becoming more and more electric. Nothing was actually said, but everybody knew. So Harold spent the summer in Normandy as William's guest. Uh, he was, in fact, captured by some obscure Norman baron who thought Harold would make uh, very good material for ransom. But when everybody found out who Harold was, William travelled to meet this baron, tapped him on the shoulder and said, look, if you know what's good for you, you'll hand Harold over to me, which he duly did. So Harold was the guest of William for the whole of that summer, which, of course, raised the question, two questions. Once again, what on earth was Harold up to? And secondly, what on earth do we do with him? Uh, do we just entertain him and, and give him board and lodging for as, as long as necessary? How long is necessary? One obvious thing, of course, is to cut his throat, uh, which would simplify the arithmetic considerably. But William, knowing what he was about to embark upon, has to make sure that he's in the right. Damn it, he's going to steal somebody else's territory. He's got to be in the right. And if, he's, if it's proved that he has committed a crime like murdering a guest, it won't do his public reputation any good. So we can't kill him. He doesn't want to send him back without getting some kind of profit. He's had Harold dropped in his lap. If he lets him go back with nothing done, it seems that he's missed a wonderful opportunity. What do we do? Well, in the summer, it was quite common for feudal lords, barons, counts, dukes, whatever, kings, they went campaigning. There was always a campaign to fight somewhere. There was always somebody on the borders of your land causing trouble, and you sent off a punitive expedition to wrap him over the knuckles and tell him to behave himself. Or you went and did some raiding yourself. It worked both ways. 
And at that particular time, um, the Duke of Brittany, next door to Normandy, was causing trouble. Conan, his name was. Um, William embarked on a campaign and took Harold with him. It seemed to make sense. It was something to do. It kept, uh, he could keep his eye on Harold. It was a way of testing Harold. It was a way for William to find out how Harold behaved. What sort of a man have we got here? And Harold, by the same token, say to himself, right, I'll watch William on campaign. See what a sort of commander he is. What's he like? What's he made of? So off they went to Brittany to besiege Count Conan and his castles. And it was very successful. And in the course of it, they had to cross a river which was noted for its marshes and quicksands. And two Norman soldiers got into trouble. And guess who fished them out but Harold, Earl of Wessex. And the picture is in the tapestry. There is Harold. You can tell it's Harold because he has a moustache. All the, all the Englishmen are depicted with moustaches. The Normans are always shown as clean-shaven, so you know who's on which side. And there is Harold dragging these two Norman soldiers out of the River Quenon. Well, William decides to make something out of this, so he has to thank Harold for what he's done, and he decides to thank him publicly. So he gives him um, a sort of Duke's honour. He makes him a knight, as the Queen did, in her recent birthday honours. But you see, in the 11th century, knighthood meant a bit more than a gong. Knighthood in the 11th century, if you became a knight created by somebody, you became that somebody's vassal. You became their inferior. You became their servant. You were committed to service to them. So what William had done was to set up a ceremony in which everybody could see that he was the overlord Harold was the vassal. Wonderful for public relations. That was not the whole of it either. Uh, the next set of panels we see is this famous oath in which Harold lays his hands on two altars and swears that when King William died, God forbid, he, Earl Harold, would help him, Duke William, to become the King of England. While at the time it seemed just an ordinary routine day-to-day -day oath. But when the oath was over, the story goes that Bishop Odo, once again up to no good, Bishop Odo had the covers taken off the altars. And there, underneath the covers, in the altars, were the relics of saints. Now, as you well know, the medieval world set great store by the relics of saints. They were magical. They could produce miracles. They were very, very significant indeed. So everybody utters gasps. Oh, my God. Harold has sworn the most holy of oaths that he will help England, uh, William become king of England. Um, well, of course, we all know, and any lawyer will tell you, that any oath sworn under duress doesn't count. But it didn't half count in 1066. William trumpeted this, as you can imagine all over Europe. Harold didn't give a damn as long as he got him out of England and got him home. He'd achieved the object of the exercise. But that's what happened. This was the famous oath at Bayeux. Um, it made sense for William, certainly, because it was a wonderful coup for public relations. Now we've got to go on to another general idea for a moment. It said we'll, we'll entertain you to a little bit of background once again. In the Middle Ages, one of the great problems for rulers was public relations. How on earth do they transmit what they want to the people? How do they transmit laws? How do they transmit orders? How do they make their will known to the people? Well, most people, as you know, couldn't read and write. There was no printing press, there was no television, there was no radio, there were no newspapers. How on earth do they do it? Well, all sorts of ways they grab any possible technique they can lay their hands on. They paint pictures, they draw pictures, they, they embroider pictures like the bio tapestry. Uh, they, they build statues. Uh, they mint coins. It's no coincidence that the king's head appears on the coins. They put up great big buildings to make everybody suitably impressed with the enormity of the king's rule. Look at the size of the Egyptian public buildings. 
uh, they travel themselves. One of the great tricks of kingship is to be seen. They know who you are, and they've seen you, and they know where you are, and they know you turn up regularly. Um, travel, travel, travel. Quite a lot of medieval kings, they say, practically rode themselves to death, going all around the country, being seen. And it was during these travels that they had to provide justice, that they had to show everybody that everything was secure, that everything was all right. The king went on these great big progresses, and it continued into the modern period. The Tudors were great travellers and progressors. Think of how many uh, manor houses where they tell you that Queen Elizabeth slept here, or where Henry VIII slept here, whatever. They loved progressing all over the place. Elizabeth was a vain woman. She adored doing this, making a great fuss and waving her hands, people cheering, and good Queen Bess and all the rest of it. So, it, but it, it, there was a reason behind it. Uh, and so you have these, you, you could call them comic strips, I suppose. Um, but they did have a reason and they did have a message. And that bit about uh, giving Harold knighthood and the swearing of the oath was absolutely invaluable because it could be seen. This was why so many ceremonies took place in public. It was no good a few barons meeting in a hall somewhere and signing a document, assuming they could write, um, nobody knew. But if it was done out in the open or in a great big hall or on a field with hundreds and thousands of people there actually witnessing it for themselves, there was no argument about that. They, they had seen it with their own eyes. And that was proof. And it was not new. The Bio Tapestry was nothing like the first comic strip. As I said, go back to ancient Egypt. Look at all those pictures on the walls of pyramids. So we're talking about something three and four thousand years old. It's as old as the hill. The Babylonians did it. Look at what the Greeks did on the, on the frieze of the Parthenon in Athens. The Emperor Trajan built this enormous column in Rome on which were engraved, carved the record of all his victories. Trajan's column. <laughs> Think of Trafalgar Square. Is it any basically different? Um, so there's a lot in the bio tapestry. Don't be put off by. Uh, if you look at the picture of of William giving arms, giving uh, knighthood to Harold, it's very easy to snigger at the fact that well, he doesn't look very much like a human being, does he? Uh, yes, you can poke fun at some of the not all the draftsmanship, but you can poke fun at some of the draftsmanship. But that's not the point. Because there are times when the draftsmanship is quite remarkable. You visit Bayer itself, go to the tapestry, and stand in front of the tapestry, that part of the tapestry, where the Norman cavalry are getting ready to advance. The drama is quite palpable. You can almost hear the beating of the hoofs on the ground. It, it, it is quite remarkable, the effect that these, these, these um, embroideries have. Uh, not done by military artists, these are done by ladies in Canterbury, where, as far as we know, they're done by English women, not Norman women. And they're done by seamstresses in Canterbury. How did they know all about this? Uh, it's also worth noting, too, that the draftsmanship is remarkable for its sheer scale. There are something like 600 people embroidered on that tapestry. 600! There are something like 200 horses. I don't know if you've ever tried to draw a horse, but it is extremely difficult. And there's one scene in that where there's a normal cavalry charge, and uh, many horses obviously fall. And it is, it is so modern. You can feel the impact of those falling horses. To this day, it, it, it is quite astounding that these women were able to do it. So don't be superior about the bio-tapestry. I said, look at it from the point of view of the 11th century. Judge it from the standards of the time. Secondly, don't be afraid of the bio-tapestry. You say, well, what's, what, what am I going to get out of it? Because all the inscriptions are in Latin. Yes, it's true. But Latin is the ancestor of English. And there are lots of Latin words which you can recognise in English today. You can make good guesses. For example, if you see Edwardus, you don't have to have an awful lot of grey cells to work out that Edwardus means Edward, or Wilhelmus means William, or Haroldus means Harold. 
bully for you. Go to the top of the class. Uh, you can deduce things. Uh, you see a picture of a ship, and underneath it says Navigarwit. You think, what the hell does Navigarwit mean? But think of our English word, navigator. And you've got a picture of a ship. So it seems a reasonable guess that Navigarwit means sailing. And you'd be dead right. So you can do a lot of Sherlock Holmes stuff as well. We have foreign words ourselves now. We, 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 you shouldn't shy away from a word just because it's foreign. We have cafe, we have buffet, we have blitz, we have spaghetti, plaza, vendetta, all these foreign words strewn across English, and we're used to them. And sheer gumption. Take the word sacramentum. Have you ever heard it? I don't suppose you have. But there is Harold sitting on the throne with an orb in one hand and a scepter in the other, and it says sacramentum. Isn't it reasonable to assume that this means a, an oath, a coronation? So there's a lot you can get out of the biotapestry. And don't expect to grab it all off the bat straight away. Uh, think about it, read it, go away, and pennies will drop when you're not looking at it. And you come back and think, oh yes, yes, of course. Why didn't I work that out before? And there aren't all that many drawings, uh, there aren't all that many words. There are far more pictures than there are words. So you can get a lot out of the bio tapestry. And don't just look at the, the action bit in the middle. They've got a freeze at the top and they've got a freeze at the bottom. And all sorts of things are going on in those freezes. Right, legendary animals and trees and people and all the rest of it. Um, but they use the freeze. Uh, it's as if there was some kind of um, roving reporter going over the battlefield, pointing his camera at evocative scenes. So you get pictures of dead men, obviously. You get pictures of the survivors pulling the chainmail tunics off the head of dead men. You see disembodied arms. You see one head up in the air. An axe has gone through that man's male collar, right through the chainmail collar one side, outside, out the other side, and taken his head off with it. It's an astounding picture. So it's all there, it's stark, and it's rude, and it's realistic. And it's done by all these genteel ladies in Canterbury. How did they find out about it? Uh, uh, and then one or two rude bits as well, a gentleman with no clothes on, who, and the, clearly their mind is not on the Battle of Hastings. And these ladies carefully, carefully stitched it all. So something as dramatic, uh, and as clever, and unique, and old, it's 950 years old, it deserves a good look. There is a chance that the French government will lend it to us later on in the year. And if they do, I strongly suggest that you, that you go and have a look. You might be very pleasantly surprised.